My name is Kishmani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishmani. <coughs> we are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here. GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you're interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the process of redoing the problem and we are on page number 170. Please turn to it, page number 170. The very first problem on the page, number 126. In problem number 126, we are told that we are dealing with an arithmetic series. We are given a series here, P, R, S, T, U, and we are told it, is a, it represents an arithmetic series. What is an arithmetic series? Well, we know what an arithmetic series is, but they are, these people are actually nice enough to define it for us. Arithmetic series is where each term after the first term, each term, so you have to have a first term. For example, your first term might be, your first term might be uh, 3, and each term after the first term they tell, is equal to the preceding term plus a constant. So here, here's an arithmetic series. So this is your first term here, and after that, each term after that is going to be preceding term plus a constant. A constant may be a positive number or negative number. So when we do that here, we end up with a negative 7. The next one is going to be negative 7 plus a negative 10, which is going to give us a negative 17. So then after that is going to be negative 17, the preceding term, preceding term plus a constant, plus a constant. The constant in, constant in this case, the constant in this case is of course negative, negative 10. So an arithmetic series is where the difference between each of the adjacent terms is constant and that's an arithmetic term series. Here's another example of arithmetic series. We may start out with negative 5 and it goes up to 2. Negative 5 to a 2 is a difference of 7. So it must go up by 7 each time. So 2 plus 7 is 9. 9 plus 7 is going to be 16 and so on and so forth. This is an arithmetic series. Here's another example of arithmetic series. We may start out with negative 7. And it goes, goes, to, it goes down to negative 7, which means here we're not adding a constant term, but we're subtracting constant term. When we say plus a constant here, the plus constant is the negative 7 plus a constant. The constant is negative 3. So then negative 10 and a negative 3 is going to give us negative 13, negative 16, and so on and so forth. I know I don't need to explain this part. This is a very simple concept, obviously. But since it's there, we have to take care of it. Now here's the question. The question is, question is, they're giving us three statements here. In the first statement, all we do is we take our series and we multiply it by two. So if you have a series, an arithmetic series, for example, let, let's make up a very simple arithmetic series: five, ten, fifteen, twenty, and so on and so forth. This is an arithmetic series. Why is it, why is it an arithmetic series? Because the difference is constant. It always goes up by five. The question is, if you were to take this series and multiply it by 2 each term, if you were to take this entire series and multiply it by 2, will the new series that we will get be also an arithmetic series? Let's find out. Times 2, times 2, times 2, times 2 and so forth. And we'll end up with 10, 20, 30, 40 and so forth. Of course it's going to be an arithmetic series. It's an arithmetic series. All we have done is multiplied everything by 2, which means whatever the difference was before between the two adjacent terms, the difference is going to be twice as much. So instead of difference being 5, the difference is 10. But of course, this is an arithmetic term. Statement number 1 is true. If you have an arithmetic term, if you have an arithmetic series, and you multiply each term in the series by 2, the new series that emerges is also an arithmetic series. Statement 1 is true. That tells us that the correct answer, whatever it is, must contain Roman numeral 1 in it. Let's look at the answer choices. Let's look at the answer choices. A, B, C, D, and E. B says 2 only. That's no good. B is not right. C says 3 only. That's not good. And E says 2 and 3. E says 2 and 3. We need 1. We establish that the 1 is correct, which means answer has to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement. In the second statement, what are we doing in the second statement? In the second statement, we are subtracting a constant. Of course, it's going to be an arithmetic series. Whatever the difference was, the difference is now going to be 3 less. We just take away 3 from each term. For example, 2, 7, 12, 17, uh, 22, 
here it goes up by 5 each time. If we subtract 3 from each term, if we subtract 3 from each term, of course the new series is also going to be an arithmetic series. It's going to be the same series as before, except the difference is going to be 3 less than before because we're subtracting 3 from each term. So we'll end up with a negative 1, a 4, uh, a 9, a 14, a 19, and so forth. So now the difference is 5. The difference is 5. Before the difference was... Oh, I'm, I, I, I am wrong. I, I, I made a mistake when I said the difference is going to be 3 less than before. It's a good thing I quote myself. Here's what's going on. Here's what's going on. The it's not going to affect the difference. The difference in the series, in the new series, is the same as before. When we subtract 3 from each term, do you know what we are doing? Essentially, it's the same exact series as before. What we are doing is we are picking up our series, and since we are subtracting 3 from each term, we essentially pick up our series and we shift it to the 3 units to the left on the number line. So every, every value that, that was there before is going to be 3 less than that, but the difference between the two adjacent terms is going to be the same as before. If we were to add 7 to each term, then we'll just pick up our series and shift it to the right by 7 units. So the difference here is the same as before. You see the difference is 5 each time. The difference was 5 before. Except instead of starting from 2, it starts at negative 3. That's it. You picked it up, and instead of starting, instead of series, instead of your series starting at uh, 2, 1, 2, instead of starting here, now it begins here. You have shifted it to the you have shifted it to the left by three units. That's what it is. It's the same series, it just it starts three three units earlier. But it is an arithmetic series. The point here is that it is an arithmetic series, which means the correct answer, whatever it is, must also contain Roman numeral 2 in it, which tells us that we can cross out, which means it has to have 1 and 2. Well, it can be, it, what does D say? D says, 1 says, 1 says, 1 only. Answer choice 1 says, 1 only. We need to have Roman numeral 2 in it, in it as well. Answer choice is not A, it's got to be D. And answer choice D says 1 and 2. D says 1 and 2. Which means the third one that they're showing here will not be an arithmetic series after we, after we do the operation that they, wanting, that they want us to do. So let's take a look at very quick look at it and see why it, is no, why it will no longer be an arithmetic series after we do the operation that they want us to do in number 3. In number 3, in number 3, they want us to take the series, whatever our series is, and square each terms. Well, if you square each term, will it still be an arithmetic series? In order for it to be an arithmetic series, the, the difference be, between two adjacent terms, for two each, each adjacent terms, has to be the same. The difference cannot change. For example, if you start out with 3, 5, 7, and 9, this is our, this is our series. If you were to square it, 3 squared, 5 squared, 7 squared, and 9 squared, now we'll end up with 9, 25, 49. We don't have to go anymore. We can, we can stop right there. Difference from here to here is 2. Difference from here to here was 2. Difference was 2. It doesn't have to be 2. The difference does not need to be 2, but the difference has to be the constant. 9 to 25. 10 to 25 would have been 15, so this is 16. A difference of 16. And from here to here, it's a difference of 24. Right there, we're done. It's no longer 9, 25, 81. It's not an arithmetic series. 9, 25, 49, 80, 100 is not an arithmetic series because difference is no longer constant. Therefore, 3 doesn't work. The answer is B, which says 1 and 2 only. Let's look at the next problem. I think I spent way too much time on it. Let's look at, let's look at the next problem, number 127. Number 127. Just give me one quick break. One twenty-seven is the one where we need to spend the time. This is a tricky one. We are told that we have x, which lies between three and one hundred. Okay, listen, listen very carefully. The question is, the question is for how many, how many values of x is the third of x, a third of x, which is same as saying. 1 over 3, obviously, the square of a prime number. First, we got to understand what they're talking about here. What they're saying here is, 
we are looking for a number, a number that li has to lie between 3 and 100. It cannot go outside that range. It must lie between 3 and 100. And it's, it, it needs to be a number that possesses the following characteristics. The, follow the characteristic that it possesses is that if you were to take a third of that number, let's say our number is n. Let's say our number is n. If you were to take a third of it, if you were to take a third of it, the third of, oh, it's actually it's not n, they're calling it x. Why should we change the name? Awesome, damn it. They're calling it x, a third of x. So, if you, if, so we have a number which they're calling x, and if you were to take a third of it, a third of x has to be such a way that it represents a square of a prime number. So this has to equal to a square of a prime number. Take a prime number, and if you square it, 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 has, to, it has to satisfy this condition. Let's see what happens. Let's list our prime numbers first from 1 to 100. So the first prime number is 2, then we have 3, then we have 5, a 7, a 11, and so forth. So this is the prime number. Let's give it a name. I'm going to call it n. Our prime number is going to be n. Our prime number right here, let's call it n. So this is our n. Now we need to square it. Now we need to square it. n squared would be 4, 9, 25, 49, and so forth. We don't have to go to 11 because 11 is already square. When you, by the time you square it, it's going to be outside 100, let alone taking a third of it. Now, it has to be such a way, this x has to be just a way that x over 3 is this quantity. x over 3 is n squared. If x over 3 is n squared, that implies that x has to be equal to 3 times n squared. x has to be 3 times n squared. So our x is going to be 12, 27, 75, and then 49 times 3 is, all, is already outside 100. Our x has to lie between 3 and 100. So 49 over 3 is already outside. There is only 3 of them. One more time. So the answer to this question is that there are only 3 such numbers. Listen very carefully. There are only 3 such numbers that lie between 3 and 100. So that if we were to take a third of this number, for example, if we were to take a third of 12, a third of 12 is 4. And 4 happens to be a square of a prime number. One more time. For how many values of x? For how many values of x is the third of the x? Here's the third. This is our x. 12 is our x here. x, a third of the x, 12 divided by 3, happens to be a square of a prime number. 12 divided by 3 is 4. 4 happens to be a square of a prime number. Here's another one. 27. 27 would do the job. 27, if you take a third of it, if you take a third of 27, that's a 9. And that happens to be a square of a prime number. There is one more right here, 75. 75 would do the job. I left no room there. I don't want to write down so low here. 75 is the third one. Or can we squeeze 75? Perhaps you can read it down there. 75 over 3. 75 divided by 3. 75 is another one. If you would take a th third of 75, 75 divided by 3 is 25. And 25 happens to be a square of a prime number. There are only three such numbers. Between, between 3 and 100, there are only three such numbers, so that if you were to take a third of those numbers, they will represent a square of a prime number. And those three numbers are 12, 27, and 75. That's it. After that, we go outside 100. The answer is there are three such numbers. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Number 128. Number 128. In number 128, they're asking us to list number of letters that can be that can be used to identify 12 people. We are told that we could identify people with the codes. The codes are going to be given to each person 
uh, in terms of uh, letters A, B, C, D, and so forth. And the question uh, and the job here is to identify tw 12 different people. And of course, these cores will have to be unique cores. We cannot give same cores to two or three different people. Obviously, let's see what the conditions are. Using using a single letter. Now, if they had stopped right there, that would have been a silly question. That would be a damn silly question because how many letters do we need to, uh, to identify 12 different peoples using the letter? Obviously, 12 codes, uh, 12 letters, a, a through whatever the 12th letter is. But this is one condition. Or we can use either a single letter or a pair of distinct letters. It's very important that we pay attention to the letter. Distinct letter. In other words, we cannot we cannot use letter D D to represent a person. That code would not represent a person because we are here. We are repeating the letters. The letters have to be distinct. They have to be different. That's not enough. There is one more condition. There is one more condition, and the third we could. And the third condition is that it has to be written. It has to be written in. alphabetical order. It has to be written in alphabetical order. For example, once we have used A, B, once we have used A, B to represent a person, once we have given a code of A, B to one person, we cannot use the code of B, A to a different person because it's no longer in alphabetical order. Do you understand? That's all. Yes, enough of the talk. Let's just do it. Okay? Let's start out with uh, Let's start out with uh, three of them, see what happens. Let's start out with three. A, B, and C. So here are the single letters. And here are the possible pairs. For single letters, it's going to be A, B, C. A, B, C. Now what kind of pairs that we can make out of it? It has to be in alphabetical order, and they have to be distinct letters, and they have to be in alphabetical order. So we can have A, B as one pair, to represent a person, we can have A, C as another pair to represent another person. We can give a code of B, C to a third person to identify the third employee. But as you can see, three letters would not do the job. Three letters, we can only identify six people with it. We have as many as 12 people. But just because three letters identify six people, you cannot jump to conclusion that we need six letters. That will be damn silly. Do you understand? Let's, let's add one more. So if we had letter number letter D, then we have to add one more here, and then we have to do all the others. A D, that's another one. A D. We can have B D. As long as we go in alphabetical order. And finally we have C D. Well, now how many do we have? We have three here. Three plus three is six. Six plus four is ten. We have identified. 10 employees so far using 1, 2, 3, 4 letters. Which tells us, which tells us that in order to identify 12 different people using this coding system, we need a minimum of 5 letters. 5 letters will more than suffice. With 5 letters we should be able to identify hell of a lot more than 12 people. But 12 people is what we have on the staff. So identify 12 different employees using this code system. We need five letters, A through E. That's all. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Number 129. 129. Number 129. Could you just excuse me one, one brief second? I'm going at a very leisurely pace here. We are into 20 minutes into it. 129. Let's see how many more there are on the page. 129. We'll do one more. Well, this this will be our last one. 129. Okay. This is an object. An object is thrown vertically upward. We are told that its height is height at any given at any given 
point in time, the height of the object at any given point in time is given by is given by the following equation. Height we are told equals 16 negative 16 t minus 3 whole squared plus 150. Question is what's the height? What is the height? What is the height? Two seconds after the object reaches the maximum height. It's a tricky question. Tricky in a sense that not because it's difficult, not because it's difficult, but because you have to pay attention to what is being asked. You have to pay attention to the wording. We are not looking for the height of the objects two seconds after it's thrown in the air. That's not what we are looking for. We are, they are asking us here, the question is a little bit more complicated than that. First, we are going to have to figure out at what precise time, at what precise point in time does the object reach the maximum height. That's the tricky part. We have to first find that. How many seconds, precisely how many seconds it takes for the object to reach its maximum height. Once we have established that part, once we have figured out exactly how long it takes for it to reach its maximum height before it begins to fall down, then we have to add two more seconds to it and then we'll figure and then we figure out the height of the objects two seconds after the object reaches the maximum height. Let's do it, shall we? I need the room, but we can do it on the top. So here's what the here's what the graph would look like. It'll be a parabola. When we when we release an object, it reach it, it goes down and this is this is the point here. First, we have to find out that part, and then we have to figure out a, a time, a two seconds after the. This is two seconds. This is the point where it reaches the maximum height. This is two seconds right here. The point is, how much is the t here? How many seconds does it take for it to reach its maximum height? Let's look at the expression. H equals we are told minus 16 times t minus 3 squared plus 150. I'm going to erase this part. And we don't need this anymore. We, we already understand the question. The question is what's the height two seconds after the object reaches the maximum height? Can you look at this expression and tell me? Can you look at this expression and tell me when would this expression reach its maximum value? Are you able to tell me? For example, what for example here, t minus 3 whatever this value is, it doesn't matter what t minus 3 is, we have to understand that it is being squared. This quantity will always be a positive quantity. This quantity will always be a positive quantity. Then we are multiplying it by negative 16. We take the positive quantity right here and we multiply it by negative 16 which is a negative quantity. So what we need to understand is that negative 16 which is a negative quantity times t minus 3 squared which is a positive quantity and negative times a positive will always be negative will always be negative. This quantity, this is a negative quantity, this is a positive quantity, and therefore this quantity will always be negative. In other words, the height of the object is going to be 150 minus some quantity at any given point in time, except, except, here is the punchline, except when this thing happens to be zero. When this thing happens to be zero. That's when the height is going to be maximum. Height is, make a note here, height is going to be, height is going to be maximum when negative 16 times t minus 3 squared equals 0. As long as this quantity is zero, then we are not taking anything away from 150. At all other time, it is going to be 150 minus some quantity. So as long as this quantity is zero, that's the maximum height. The maximum height is 150. The question is, at what precise time will it reach 150 feet in the air? So let's find out by setting this equal to zero. So here we have negative 16 times t minus 3 squared is equal to zero. So here we have a quantity A times a quantity B equals zero. This means either A has to be equal to zero or B has to be zero. Well, obviously, negative 16 is not 0. Negative 16 cannot be 0. So that implies 
that implies that it is the t minus 3 that needs to be 0. t minus 3 has to be 0. Technically what it is is t minus 3 squared which is 0, which, which in turn implies that t minus 3 has to be 0. Which implies that the time that, reach, time that it takes for it to reach maximum height is precisely 3 seconds. That's it, we're done. It is precisely 3 seconds. And now we can plug in and we're looking for the height two seconds after it reaches the maximum height. It takes three seconds to reach maximum height. The question now is, what's going to be the height two seconds after it reaches the maximum height? Well, two seconds after it reaches maximum height is altogether five seconds. So we can answer that by putting five in there. Let's do it. So when t is equal to five, when t is, and five comes from the fact that it is two seconds after it reaches the maximum height, three seconds is what it takes to reach the maximum height. Let's do it here. So t equals 5, we put it in here, and h would equal to negative 16 times 5 minus 3 squared plus 150. 5 minus 3, 5 minus 3 is 2, 2 squared is 4, 4 times 16 is 64, so it is 150 minus 64. And whatever that happens to be. That's going to be 6. 9 minus 6 is going to be 7. Did I make a mistake? I think I made a mistake. That's going to be 6, and then 14, nine, well, where's 9? There's no 9. 14 minus 6 is 8. 86 feet is the answer. The last thing that I want to do in this question, which is not being asked in this problem, I'm just going to do it here just so we understand the thing here, and I need a nice place to where I, we can draw the graph. Let's do it up here again. So here's our graph. It reaches the maximum height here at t equal to 3. The height we just found out was t is equal to 5, which is, which is 2 seconds after it reaches the height. You see 3 plus 2. I also want you to realize that the height that the object reaches at t, t equal to 5, 5 seconds after its release, is going to be the same height at t minus 2. t, 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 3 minus 2. 3 minus 2. t is equal to 1. The height of the object, the maximum height, because it's a symmetric, it's a, it's a symmetric function. So the, whatever the height is reaches at maximum, uh, the, the maximum height of the object is at 3 seconds. So whatever height the object reaches 2 seconds after it reaches the maximum height is exactly the same height two seconds before it reaches the maximum height. Two seconds before it reaches the maximum height, maximum height is at three seconds. Two seconds before that is going to be t equal to one. And if you put in t equal to one here, you'll get the same answer. You'll get the same answer. Let's do it here, t equal to one. Or can we do it? Let's do it here. t equal to one will have the same height as t equal to five. Our expression was h equals negative 16 times t minus 3 squared plus 150. Negative 16, and if t is equal to 1, so it's going to be 1 minus 3 plus 150 plus 150. Are you able to see that 1 minus 3 is going to be negative 2, and negative 2 squared is same as 2 squared. 5 minus 3 is 2 squared, and so is 1 minus 3. 1 minus 3 is also 2 squared because it's a negative 2 squared which is a 4. This quantity is equal to 4 and so was that quantity. And therefore again we have the same value 4 times negative 16 is negative 64 and 150 is the same height. Do you understand? Now if I had drawn a little bit lower here I could have shown you one more scenario. Let's draw a little bit lower here so we can see one more scenario. Let's pretend it's here. This is, this is uh, 5 and this is t equal to 1. That means one second after it reaches the maximum height, one second reaches, reaches the maximum height, which is going to be four seconds. The height of the object at four seconds is also going to be the same as the height of the object at two seconds. The, the height of the object one second after it reaches the maximum height is the same height as one second before it reaches the maximum height, which is t equal to two. Now, if you like, you can do that on your own. Put in t equal to two and put in t equal to four, in this expression here and you will see that you will get the same value. I won't do it here. Okay? Let's stop here. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay? Bye now.